new strategies to optimize digital and physical marketing, why you should fire 10% of your clients, and how to overcome a life-threatening accident to become a better entrepreneur and human being. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Welcome to Legends and Losers, my legendary friends, where we aspire to have authentic dialogues that inspire you to design a legendary business and a legendary life. And man, oh man, am I glad you're with us today because on Legends and Losers, we have Vaughn O'Connor. And Vaughn and I have gotten to know each other as ski buddies, uh, ski buddies for the love of, for the love of whoever, surf buddies. I met the amazing Vaughn O'Connor years ago on a surf trip in Fiji. And uh, we've been uh, in touch ever since and uh, become friends. And he is one of Australia's top marketing gurus. And he's an entrepreneur and the founder of Australia's Rapid Media. And we'll get more on Vaughn in a second. Uh, off the top, I would like to thank uh, Eric Weinmeyer. Eric is an extraordinary human being. Uh, he's a guest here on Legends and Losers, episode 47 and 48. And he's one of the most inspiring human beings I've ever had the opportunity to spend time with. He's an extreme adventure athlete. He has summited all of the seven summits, including, of course, Mount Everest. And uh, his kind of most recent thing that he's been talking about that his new book, No Boundaries, is about um, is, is called, um, excuse me, is, is that he, he solo kayaked the Grand Canyon. And Eric is blind. And uh, he's just an amazing guy to hang out with. Anyway, I wanted to thank Eric. He wrote a fantastic uh, review that really touched my heart. Um, uh, about Legends and Losers on, I, on iTunes, yeah. So Eric, thank you so much. Most importantly, thank you for being a guest on, legendar on, on Legendary and Losery. <laughs> and most importantly, thank you for your incredible work of your foundation and being the awesome inspiration that you are, Eric Weinmeier. Now, uh, I have to say a little something more about this celebrity actor named uh, Matthew McConaughey. Um, so uh, I don't really know who this guy is. I found out a little bit more about him. He seems like a very cool guy. He was in a movie called The Lincoln Lawyer, and I guess he's been in a whole bunch of other things. I, I don't really keep track of this world. Um, and um, and uh, he's also in some very weird Lincoln Continental ads. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen those, but that, that's what I remember him for. But anyway, he's a very cool dude. And I guess one of the things he's famous for, and this recently came to my attention, is his expression, all right, all right, all right. And um, I'm not quite sure how I landed on all right, all right, all right, but I can guarantee you it had nothing to do with Matthew because I don't, didn't really know who he was when I first started to say it, and I sure didn't know he said that. And... Um, uh, Nancy Summers and I have been sort of playing with Matthew on uh, uh, Twitter. He, he's not playing with us, at least not as of yet. <laughs> but I have challenged him, and I challenge him again here on Legends and Losers, to an all right, all right, all right off. And Matthew, if you're willing to come on Legends and Losers, um, uh, I also want to let you know that we will help you raise money for your nonprofit. So this is the part I really want to tell you about. Um, uh, he's um, he was selling these all right, all right, all right t-shirts. And he was selling, he's selling them to raise money for a foundation he started with his wife called Just Keep Living with No G Foundation at Just Keep Living, or excuse me, at jkliving.org. And uh, he and his wife Camilla started this and they are dedicated to empowering high school students by providing them with the tools to lead active lives and make healthy choices for a better future. So, all right, all right, all right. That's a great charity. Uh, awesome that you're doing that with your spouse, Matthew. And uh, we wish you well with the charity. And the gloves are off, buddy. It's time for you to come on Legends and Losers and do an all right, all right, all right off. <laughs> now, my buddy, Vaughn. Vaughn O'Connor is originally from Australia's uh, world famous Tasmania. Now, I don't know about you. But when I was a kid, I, I thought Tasmania was a, I, actually, I didn't even know it was a place because I knew it, of course, from the Tasmanian devil. So I, I, as a kid, you don't know why things are named what they're named. But, you know, I can remember being 
uh, you know, maybe a young teenager when I found out Tasmania is actually a place. And uh, you, you'll, you'll hear um, Vaughn is very proud of his roots in Tasmania. And uh, I have other Tasmanian friends. So uh, uh, not only do I cl collect legendary Australians, I seem to have a handful of legendary Tasmanian Australians in my life, which is uh, really fun. Um, Vaughn is the founder and managing director of Rapid Media in New South Wales, Australia. And Rapid Media has become one of the most preeminent marketing firms in the country. And Vaughn is one of the most preeminent uh, Australian thought leaders in marketing. He also happens to be uh, one of the warmest guys I've ever met. I met Vaughn on a, um, a surf trip, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, and at the time I was really struggling with my surfing. Surfing, uh, particularly in the first couple of years for me was very, very hard. I was not natural at it and I failed miserably uh, over and over and over again. And for whatever reason on this surf trip, you know, you go away to do something like this. And of course, in this case, I wanted to surf really well, have a good time, you know, hang out with my buddies, both in the water and out of the water. And I just kind of had a meltdown with my surfing. All my mechanics fell apart and uh, I was feeling pretty depressed about it. And, you know, Vaughn's just the kind of guy who puts his arm around you and uh, gives you a pep, pep talk. And he gave me some very specific ideas for uh, how I could kind of take a step back, slow down and refire my surfing life. And um, it really made a difference to me. It's, it may sound funny to you, but, you know, uh, you could probably relate if you've had a, a passionate thing that for whatever reason you're losing at, um, it, it, takes a, it takes a friend and, uh, you know, somebody who cares to, to get you out of that situation. More recently, Vaughn uh, was, uh, he suffered a horrible surfing accident that by all accounts should have taken his life. And Vaughn persevered and I think has come out the back end of that a better uh, entrepreneur, a better husband, a better dad, and a better human being. Not that he wasn't a, a great, a great, uh, great at all of those things before that. But he's really a wonderful guy. He was here in California recently visiting uh, some technology firms in the Silicon Valley, and I thought it'd be a great opportunity to sit down. And so here he is, my friend, Vaughn O'Connor. So um, take me to Tasmania, Vaughn. Well, I'm very passionate about my Tasmania. And um, for anyone that's ever done the full visit of every state of Australia, you'll probably realize it is the most beautiful state. Although I don't permanently live there at the moment, I've still got a bit of a foothold in a little place called King Island. K King Island? King Island is world-renowned for its dairy and its beef and it's just a beautiful place. But it's a little island right in the middle of what they call Bass Strait. And Bass Strait's smack bang in the middle of Victoria and Tasmania. So wild sort of ocean area, but just an absolute pristine little microclimate in the middle. But What's the climate like? Um, look, it, it gets a little bit windy from time to time, but that brings up the waves. And, um, yeah, look, it's, it's very similar to probably what, what you had experiencing right here in Santa Cruz. So, so beautiful weather in the, in the mid seventies, a lot of the time Celsius. That'll test me because I'm a, I'm a. You know, All right, well, give it to me in, uh, oh, excuse me, in Fahrenheit is what I just yeah, said. Yeah. What is it in Celsius? Well, look, at you know, generally summer, it'll get to about 25 and uh, probably up to as high as 30 and then winter can dive below 10, but very rarely gets much below that. Yeah. And so you're very proud of your Tasmanian heritage. Well, you know, it's a beautiful little state. It's actually doing exceptionally well now and in in, you compare all the other Australian states and the economy, the... Uh, very lucky to have had a, a major museum called Mona, which is the Museum of Modern Art. Modern Art, yeah. Yeah, and um, the guy that's curated that has got a very interesting background. He was a professional gambler, um, basically made enough money in the casinos all over the world to actually buy up a whole stack of really cool art and made a, a massive tourism destination that's pretty much saved the Tasmanian economy from the best I can tell. So, an, uh, so a, a poker player who opened a modern uh, art museum is a major driver of the Tasmanian economy. Well, how's that? I suppose if it's, uh, he's created such an amazing attraction to people to make it a holiday destination. Um, wow. What kind of art is in this museum? Well, Chris, it's a bit confronting. There is a whole wall of vaginas. <laughs> what? It sounds a bit out there, but they're basically one of the major pieces that people look at. And it's not probably the place to take your children to, but they've actually cast a wall of 
a myriad of different vaginas. When you say cast a wall, what do you mean cast a wall of vaginas? <laughs> They've actually molded. They've actually had a number of people actually donate their time to have their... You mean actual ladies donated their, I love the way you say that, donated their time to have a molding made of their privates? Yes, exactly that. And then it's all up there one by one next to each other on a wall. How, how, you got to ask how, how many vaginas are we talking about here? I haven't actually visually seen the vaginas. I've only heard about it. Uh, so you haven't been yet? I haven't been yet, but I'm actually very thankful that Mona, and now please, for anyone to think that it's just all about that, it's not. They've got some amazing other modern art. Yeah. But the whole thing is meant to be a little bit confronting, take you out of your comfort zone, but people are flying from all over the world to see. Wow. To see this. And you know, that just... Around. That just proves of how attractive vaginas can be. <laughs> oh, God. And um, when did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur, Vaughn? Well, look, I, I was a little bit lucky because I got a tap on the shoulder from um, my father. Um, my father had a, a health scare. He basically had a grade five malignant melanoma, and he's one of the luckiest guys in the world to be still walking around now. But I was only 12. And, and they told him he wasn't going to live. Is that right? I got told he had about six weeks. And, um, at, and you were 12. And how old was your dad? He would have been 38 at the time. Um, look, dad just refused to give up, but he also got very lucky. There was a, an amazing um, medical facility called the Peter McCallum. Um, clinic in Melbourne and they were cancer specialists and they actually pumped him up on some miracle trial drug and then he did everything else health-wise he could do to turn it around and just refused to leave us as a family and you know like he's my absolute hero um your dad's your hero yeah like he was my best man at my wedding how cool is that and so, why is your dad your hero Vaughn? Look, I think dad's always been one of those parents that takes it very importantly to say, you know, I want you to learn all the mistakes I've made early and I basically want you to still have your own personality and flourish, but he's not backwards and coming forward. So when I, you know. He's not backwards and coming forwards. What, what does that mean? It's an Australian term to say, if you have something to say, say it, don't hold back. It's funny. My grandfather, Jack, used to have a very similar, uh, I think he said, don't move backwards when you're moving forwards or something like that so look dad pretty much prompted me to jump early and to um what's that word that everyone uses now the buzzword fail fast yeah so look he, he worked for somebody else who he's still very good friends with a great man called warren von bibra um warren but then dad parted ways about three years after dad's illness dad just decided you know managing and you know, 100 plus staff probably was um, not what he wanted to do after going through the illness, but he, he jumped out and started his own business and mum and dad have done quite well with their own. What, what kind of business is it, Vaughn? They're in the auto game. So uh, to be honest, it was a delight as a kid who loves cars to be around that. We were always and, doing up cars. And, and we got to talk about you and cars and you and your dad and cars, and but you have some pretty fucking cool cars. I've got a few I like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But um, look, Dad um, said to me after probably jumping out in his uh, early forties, mid forties, to do his own thing. He said to me, "Look, you, don't, you shouldn't wait. You shouldn't actually go. I mean, two or three years out of university is enough for you to work for someone else, and then you need to actually get out and do your own thing. Whatever mistakes you'll make, you'll you'll if you can get it all out of your system by the time you're thirty or forty, you're in good stead." And so your dad really pushed you to go out on your own and to be an entrepreneur. Oh, look, I just wanted to be like the puppy dog following around the master. Like I pretty much said, I want to finish school and come back. And, and I always worked with dad at the car yard anytime I could. So I was the, the cleaner, the car detailer, the, you know, the, the lunch boy. I'd do any job I could be to be there. Um, How old were you when you first started working in your dad's auto business? Look, he made up a job. He was pretty clever. He basically decided I wouldn't be off with my mates doing anything I shouldn't be doing if I was working. So school holidays, probably around that sort of 12, 13 um, years of age. He'd 13? 13. <laughs> he'd, uh, he'd put me on the broom in the middle of, do you, you have, where do all your autumn leaves fall? Is it fall? Or? Yeah, yeah. Our, our autumn leaves uh, here in this part of California are you know, October, September, October, yeah. and by November, they're starting to fall on the ground for sure. Yeah, so we'd, we'd get that around school holidays in March, April. Kind of yeah, period. which is your fall. Yeah, and a terrible job, but for eight hours, he'd put me on a broom and I wasn't allowed to have one leaf showing in the car yard. 
So the whole thing's lined with trees with falling leaves. But that was his way of saying, you earn your $20 a day, but I kept to keep an eye on you. At, at, at what age, Vaughn? Oh, I think that was 12 or 13. Yeah, yeah. So working very, uh, very early. and But you were even entrepreneurial before that, were you not? Well, the same business was very good to me. They actually gave me one whole wall of their car yard for my little surfboard business. So I had used to sell new and secondhand surfboards at a young age. There was a legendary shaper in Australia called Jim Banks. And um, I saved up all my money from raking leaves. And actually, uh, Warren, who was dad's boss, who I mentioned before, she was my first ever business partner. He actually stumped up half the money. I stumped up half the money and then I put my deepest voice on for a 12-year-old before I'd matured and called the uh, owner of Banks, Jim Banks, and said, you know, I want to be a Tasmanian distributor. So I think you've got Surfer Magazine over here, don't you? That was your big magazine? Yeah, Surfer and Surfing. Yeah. yeah. Well, well had, of course, Surfer's Journal, which is the Bible. Yeah. Well, we had this cool, cool magazine called Tracks and Tracks wasn't a glossy magazine. It used to come out in newspaper print, but that pretty much was the thing that you would wait to come out the new edition and hear all about your surfing legends, Mark Richards and, you know, Simon Anderson and all these guys that were just out of this world. And, um, yeah, like I reckon it was the proudest day of my life when I basically got the, the newspaper of the Tracks magazine arrived and down the bottom of the bank's surfboards um, ad there was Tasmanian distributor Vaughan O'Connor. So that was pretty cool back then. And, and how old was Vaughn O'Connor when uh, this ad came out listing oh, you as the distributor for Tasmania for banks? I think it was exactly around 12 years old. 12 years old, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also, uh, uh, didn't you do a little bit of livestock trading at a pretty young age as well? Well, I did. I had um, an uncle in the family I thought had the coolest job ever because we're growing up on, on a bit of land. We we're always around animals and livestock and, you know, and, and part of it was, you know, you get used to it as a kid. There's there's the sheep come, the sheep go, the, you know, the cattle are there for a while, then the cattle go. But um, I thought it would be a fantastic thing to follow in his footsteps. So one day I, we didn't have... Your uncle. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I used to scour the newspaper for opportunities and basically one popped up there as... 50 sheep and they were for sale for I think two dollars a, a head so I decided to make a little bit of quick money on that one how, how old are you at this stage Yvonne I was 10 or 10 to 11 years of age at this stage but um and I look I, I said to my mother you need to drop me downtown and in behind where my father's car used to be there was a large paddock with a, a livestock ramp so basically I, I had the sheep turn up on a semi-trailer herded them off into the paddock, <laughs> said to the trailer driver. And your parents didn't know this was happening, I assume. I think my mother finally twigged to what I was up to once she was there and there was an offloading of livestock. So so I just want to make paint the picture for me. This is at your dad's uh, car dealership, is that right? It was one of them, but there was a little bit more of a rural spot and they basically had a, a, a vacant paddock that could probably hold I see. like a, trading, a livestock trading yard at the back of it. But your parents did not know 50 head of sheep were showing up at your dad's place. No, no, not at all. And and obviously the issue then was I didn't have the cash on me. I had to wait for the purchaser to turn up. So it was that first time I had that knot in my throat. Going, so so wait a minute, I just want to make sure. Is this deal really going to happen? Your parents have no idea. 50 head of sheep show up. The seller is there wanting his or his money. No, the seller hadn't even arrived at this stage. The, oh, sorry, the seller, yes. The seller, the seller is, is there saying, hey, where's my money? Did the seller know you were a 10-year-old kid? Had no idea. No yeah. Idea. But basically, so I just said to him, look, can you come back in half an hour? I'll give you your money in half an hour. And then the buyer turned up and, and pretty much I loaded the sheep on him. How, how did you as a 10-year-old bun convince the seller to go fuck off for half an hour so that you could wait for the buyer to show up? I think he just realized at that point he'd already offloaded the sheep and he didn't want to put them back on. So it was better to wait for half an hour than to work out. But I think that knot that you get in your stomach on a deal, yeah. a little bit of nervous tension, you know, that, was probably that, that feeling got embedded at that point in time. And, and what, is your dad there when this is happening or your mom there? He had no idea. So I got a little bit of a talking to when I got home. Okay, so your parents aren't there. You're handling this all by yourself. 
well, I think my dad quietly was quite proud after the fact because when I've turned zero into 150 quick dollars, because the seller price was five dollars per head, the the buy price was $2. so there's a three dollar spread. That's it. That's it. Those are healthy margins for a ten year old. <laughs> that was a lot of video games back in the day. I, I, I love it. I love it. And um, uh, I'm curious because uh, you started in the auto business with your dad after you were a successful sheep trader at 10. <laughs> well, why didn't you just stay in the auto business? Look, I would have. Um, I pretty much got told I wasn't allowed to before I went off to university and I had to do something different. So so your, your dad, even though he wanted you to be an entrepreneur, he didn't want you to be in, in his business. I think he found, and, and probably put into perspective, at, at this stage, um, he was going through, the, I suppose, the situation of, of um, dealing with his own health issues, also sort of assessing things, being out doing his own thing. And um, look, he just wanted a skill set. Um, he wanted us to actually go out and actually learn something a bit different. My, my brother was an amazingly uh, gifted athlete. So he was playing um, your equivalent of NFL gridiron over here. He was playing Australian rules football at the top level. So, and then That's a gnarly play. sport, Australian it's, rules football, isn't it? It's good fun to play. Because it's sort of as if, is this fair? I mean, I've seen it. I don't really know what's going on because I don't really know what I'm watching, but it sort of looks like if rugby and American football had a baby. Is that? Yeah, look, I mean... It's become a lot. I mean, it's become a lot faster. They've changed the rules quite a bit. They keep a free flowing game with it. Um, but it's full contact, and they don't wear any protection, right? No, no. But I, no, I, I love the way you say that. Like, no, nah, well, we're Australians. We don't need. We don't need all those pads for pussies and things, yeah, right? Yeah. We'll deal with our injuries later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey spe- speaking of injuries, what does it feel like to break your pelvis? Oh. Um, Look, it's a big story. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, I want to, I want to hear it. It's, it's an incredible. I mean, I didn't, I never even thought about breaking your pelvis. Mm. Well, look, I'm a mad keen surfer, always have been, and, and probably at times have when I've been a bit younger. Do you even remember learning to surf on? I do, I do. I, my father wasn't a surfer, but he liked the idea of me surfing. So he actually was given a board by one of his buddies and gave it to me. And that was the love affair of water and waves started. So I was pretty lucky with that. But look, um, I had a major injury in January 2014 surfing overseas. And for anyone that surfed long enough and probably pushed the limit a little bit beyond their capabilities, um, it can happen. It's obviously, it's a very safe sport, but it's also slightly unpredictable. Did time. you have any inclination that day or that trip in Bali that um, you were uh, too far over your skis, so to speak? No, look, I think I'd had three days surfing the same. I mean, to be fair, I'd actually asked my wife to get there a couple of days earlier than we'd originally planned because I knew the peak of the swell was coming and, and had actually surfed that. We'd had three days. I mean, I'd snap boards, snap leg ropes, had to swim for my life a couple of days prior to the big accident happening. So I knew it wasn't. And are you used to surfing in environments where you're bored and your leashes and shit are breaking all the time? Not all the time. I mean, I think um, generally not now at all. I'm not allowed to. My wife basically banned anything over a certain limit. But um, look, I got hit so hard by a lip of a wave at it pushed me into my board, ripped my pelvis apart and broke my back and left me paralyzed two and a half kilometers out to sea. So I pretty much uh, then had to had my legs ripped apart because my pelvis was apart, trying to keep it together. Um, I had to hold my surfboard next to my ribs and broke four ribs so that the next two waves pushed me into the gully. And then uh, I screamed out to my mate and said, this is a bit serious. And uh, luckily, what could you feel at the time? And so that moment you're screaming out to your mate in the water, what, what, what is it? What are you feeling? Look, blinding pain is probably the word. Like ultimately, um, I didn't know whether a shark had bitten me in half. I really didn't know what had happened. All I could do as soon as I gathered my senses to say I can't use, I have no propulsion from waist down. I was sort of paralyzed from where my back had, had, had broken. Um, and I knew I was bleeding. So, so I just want to make sure I understand, Vaughn. So, it tears your pelvis in half. And then they call it an open book. So it's almost like the gate goes against its hinge. 
I see. So the, the gate being the pelvis. Part of the pel- one side of the pelvis pulls away so violently that it actually cracks your sacrum in the back of your hip where it joins, like the gate going against its hinge. Son of a bitch. And that br- ends up breaking your lower back, your sacrum. It Is that your sacrum in half. So the, the removal of the pelvis from the, the wall of your body, so to speak, the back of your body where it connects, tears it. So your pelvis got torn from your spine. What? Yeah, look, and the, the is that worst, fair? Is that what happened? Well, the pelvis is at the front, so it's a yeah, little bit, yeah, yeah. So look, technically, you you completely split in half from the front, <laughs> which is not the nicest of, especially when you're in giant waves and in an unpredictable. And the waves are two to three times overhead. That's right. So 20 something foot waves, if you measure them from the base. Yeah. Look, if any of my Australian friends would hear me say 20 foot, I'd deny it, but it's probably in our scale, eight to 10 to 12. Yeah. On the face. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be a modest way of measuring it. Right. But if you were to take it from the top of the lip to the bottom of the wave About at its three peak. times of overhead high for anyone that doesn't surf. So yeah, and you being... Six, I'm six foot. Yeah, so it, there are some serious waves at a very serious break, and you're not in much water, right? How, no, how, it, was very, it was very shallow. Like it, it, it hit me in, in... I was about a meter and a half underwater at the time, trying to actually duck under the wave, and the lip unpredictably fell on top of me, and, and that was it. But look, lucky, lucky enough, I basically got, got into past that point out the back where I would have just been taken away in the current. Cause I really so are you, are you paddling yourself out past where the waves are breaking or how do you get from the danger zone, the, the impact zone to safety? I just had to hold, I had no way of lying on the board cause my back was broken. So I had to just grip onto it and hold it as tight as I could, knowing that if I let go of it, I had nothing to float me. And your leash has been torn off at this point, so you you cannot let go of that board. Well, uh, basically, I just knew if I let go, I die. And yeah. then I got through, and then it was the next challenge, which was we had uh, like at least a kilometre of water to get back across with an outgoing tide. And I said to my mate Craig, um, can you take your leash off and paddle? I have to hold the leash in my hands. And it was almost like a giant boat anchor sideways on a surfboard rather than on the, the proper way. Um, and we just had to tell stories and basically try to keep me from going into shock. And yeah, look, I, I, the pain at the time. And he, and he, so you're holding onto his leash while he's paddling you back to shore That's as right. the, as the uh, tide is coming out, dragging him back out so to it's sea. A good job for him. Lucky he's a fit, fit guy. And, you know, obviously I was, um, I was a bit like in the carriage going, yeah, I'm you hurry. I'm not going to make it. So, um, it was um, so when you say to one of your buddies, "Hey, I'm dying over here." <laughs> yeah, well, not to be melodramatic, I think people have had injuries, and 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 you know, I, I got to the hospital, um, and there was a bit of a funny story that it took twelve little Indonesian men to lift me up because I'm not the smallest of humans. On a you you weigh about two forty ish. Yeah, yeah. So. They put so it on, took 12 Indonesian guys to get you out of the water. They had to lift me on a St. Regis uh, sunbed that was out the front of the resort that was watching all this unfold. And then I had to be face down. I couldn't lie on my back because it was just excruciating. And like even to get to that point, I was sort of lucky to, to, to make it. But I got to hospital. They wanted to actually uh, delicately take off my my expensive early board shorts so I think I'd invested in and I just said cut them off <laughs> just the pain just bring the bring the morphine bring it on but I had 15 minutes worth of blood left in my circulatory system from internal bleeding before I went into cardiac arrest did you so, see any blood in the water at all no it was all internal but I turned into like a giant bruised banana the next so your, your body was swelling like crazy pretty much from knees to stomach two days later a bit like when you bruise you bruise your, your knee or your elbow and it turns purple so from your knees to your belly button is sort of exploding like a crazy bru like a crazy bruise yeah. might yeah and and look the, the what certain, about I mean I, I hate to ask you about this but you know what about your man bits? Well, lucky for Mr. and Mrs. O'Connor, I sort of dodged a major bullet on that one. So uh, I'm now the uh, very proud father of four beautiful babies. Um, and, yeah, we've had, had one of them since the uh, – so we don't need to go into that too much. We're all, we're all good. 
But it's it's got to be scary because your man bits were damaged, were they not? Um, look, when you you when you have an open book pelvic fracture, that's exactly the spot that everything pivots off. So uh, yeah, luckily the skillful surgeon managed to actually stick me back together again, and it all was in the right spot and it all worked. So, but there was a few nervous moments talking to the urologist about whether or not I was actually going to uh, be a man still. Wow. So, so you almost became a hermaphrodite. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think at the time I actually said to a few people, I've, I've been told I will ne- possibly not walk again, never surf again. And I only had really had one concern was, can I be romantic with my wife still? Uh, yeah. You know, as, as a man, that's, that's where we go. It's like, well, um, I, I, I might be able to give up surfing, but this other thing, I don't know. But look, luckily, luckily I've got um, some amazing medical professionals that help me out. Um, but it's quite a medical journey because in the beginning, you're in a hospital in Bali, right? And I have to say, whatever you've heard about medical care overseas in Indonesia, um, I couldn't have been more looked after. We, we went to, um, the B, it's called the BIMC International Hospital in Nusa Dua. It was the one that the Australian government had donated um, to Bali after the terrible Bali bombings. Um, so the Australian government donated a bunch of money to build a, build a world-class hospital. Yeah. And look, the surgeon was... How talking. incredible how that fate would have it such that your government well, had donated this, this hospital that yeah. saved your life. But look, we still go back to Bali. Like part of recovering from any kind of trauma is sort of facing it. And um, been back to the beach that it happened. I go back with my wife and my kids quite frequently. And, and each time we call into that hospital and give the surgeon and all the nursing staff a whole bunch of sweets and chocolates and a bottle of whiskey. But um, just to say thank you, because, you know, to be fair, I wouldn't be here without them. And, and you know, I got wheeled off into surgery and been told I had a 50% chance. Um, had to kiss the whole... Of survival. Thing. Yeah. Had, uh, I was a fair, I was in pretty rough shape and um, they brought me back. And, and look, luckily, one complication from the accident was I had a, a hematoma the size of an orange um, that they didn't get to. And basically... Where was that hematoma? Right next to my bladder in my stomach. So they had to, um, for anyone that's ever had a really bad infection internally, they they have to actually take blood from you every day and actually check your markers. And I got back to Australia and had some amazing um, medical assistance. So each day though, I felt like a pin cushion. I'd go in and they take, believe it or not, they take it out of two arms because they don't want to pick up a, a surface-borne bacteria out of the test. So they actually take it from two points on your body and then they culture it and actually see whether or not there's the, any bacteria level above what it should be. So that was part of basically, and they alter, they actually take, if there are any um, bacteria, they will actually go and actually create a specific antibiotic that can actually knock it off. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah I had a similar experience, not myself, but with someone that's uh, that I love dearly uh, lately. But I'm also curious, so you get home, you've had this surgery, and you're on the path to recovery and they tell you some pretty shocking things that you should expect as you try to recover, don't they? Well, basically um, what happens, your body, I mean, anyone that's had a bad injury in any part of the body know how um, your muscular system basically needs to be used for it to actually stay active and usable. So um, ultimately my, my glutes and everything that you and my hamstrings uh, withered away. Um, unfortunately, all my groins had to be stitched back in from when the the pelvis was ripped apart. So um, the only thing that I could walk off at the time was those stitched in. So your um, groin muscles had to be stitched back, back into your pelvis. Yeah. Yeah, because I would imagine all that connective tissue is torn. Of course, the muscle's torn, right? Yeah, and that's what causes all the bleeding and the internal bleeding. I mean, uh, um, but look, uh, what, what ended up happening is I got a, a very, very good... Um, exercise physiologist and physiotherapist. So Andy Wafer and Shona, amazing physiotherapists in my hometown. Um, they really looked after me and got me back and moving and acupuncture and therapy. And, and it wasn't easy. Like you'd almost like pass the piece of wood, kind of chew on this while we while we get all this stuff moving again. And then um, I've got a wonderful guy called John Comer, who's a good mate, great surfer, um, but exercise physiologist. And he really probably made me get things moving again so as soon as my hamstrings switched back on then every step didn't feel like a dagger going through my, my groin 
So, so what was it like though, then Vaughn, when they come to you, you're, you're far into your recovery, right? Four months in. Four months in. And they say, uh, Hey Vaughn, there's a problem and we got to go back into your pelvis. Well, look, they were routinely, I suppose this is the thing about a great surgeon as opposed to a good one. So I wasn't just released to say good luck with your recovery. I was made to go and get x-rays every couple of months and every yep. six weeks. And they unfortunately, I got probably the worst phone call I could get and told, um, well, good that you've just started to learn to walk again. But basically, unfortunately, you've cracked one of the 16 screws and two plates that are in there keeping it all together. So it's got to come out. Um, and at the time, I could feel something was wrong. Like I'd sit down in the wrong spot and all of a sudden it felt like a, somebody had jammed a, a screwdriver into me, but that was the broken screw. Because it was yeah, it was literally the screw. So I had a um, an amazing um, surgeon in Brisbane um, called Cameron Cook. And Cameron basically is like the Mr. Wolf of Pulp Fiction when it comes to surgeons. He's the guy that <laughs> fixes everyone else's problems. So he, um, he actually... the. Balinese doctors did nothing wrong. Like they did an amazing surgery. It's just this was just one of those freaky, freaky things. There's a lot of tension and torque that goes on in that lower part of your body, and as much as it's titanium, it basically just cracked. So they had to uh, take out all the hardware, and they go in like a cesarean section. So they pretty much cut all your abdominal muscles apart again. Um, going, look, the good thing about it is I've only got now one plate and four screws keeping me together. Um, so a whole lot of that stuff that was probably irritating, um, my whole system and recovery goes away. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I was back to square one. It was pretty much start to learn to walk. So after four months, you're just really starting to feel like you're coming back. You're learning to walk again. Yeah. But boom. You're look, a, at, uh, and meanwhile, to, your business is thriving, right? Well, I have to say through this whole thing, I used it as a giant life filter. So basically, I had some amazing people and I had some not so amazing people. I had a, a few clients on the negative that basically didn't understand that I couldn't travel or I'd die or, you know, it was pretty much, we need you down to do this work for us and saying, look, I can do a conference call and I know we need you in person. If you're not here, we'll have to get someone else to do it. And, you know, then I basically had some amazing clients that would basically fly, sit by my bedside, uh, you know, have the, the uh, boardroom discussion by my bedside with me to do their strategy for media for the year. So, you know, I can't tell you when you're in your lowest point uh, physically to have that, that love and support from your clients. Like, you know, I'd die for those guys and, and, you know, we've had plenty of opportunities since to prove the point that, you know, we've become very close since the relationship has, um, has been formed like that. But from a personal level, um, we just had our third baby daughter Zara and um, she pretty much lied on my, on my uh, stomach. And I remember seeing all those photos on Facebook and, and you wrote some really touching things about uh, how horrible it was to have the accident, but at the same time to have this beautiful uh, baby crawling all over you. Yeah. Look, it's, I, I suppose um, I, I did a bit of research up front and um, one of the issues with the injury is that it's in a, it's not like you've pulled a, a, a hamstring and they've got blood flow and a muscle that gets all the goodies back to fix it. Um, in that area, there's low blood flow and basically it doesn't, it takes a long time to recover and to, to get over it. And a lot of people get hooked on painkillers trying to get through that because it's not very pleasant. But a lot of the research showed at the time that um, for people that weren't healing, that actually inject um, something to stir up the inflammation to actually try to prompt the healing response. So I decided very early in the piece, no painkillers, just go cold turkey on it. And um, So at what point did you say, I'm not going to take painkillers anymore? Look, pretty much uh, we were 15 days in Bali in hospital and I got flown back to Australia. Two weeks after I got back into the country, I pretty much said, that's it, no more Panadol. I wouldn't even have a Panadol. So, um, and probably the worst one. And why did you think not taking painkillers was going to help with your recovery? Look, I suppose um, I just decided that my body's telling me where I need to either be careful of moving or basically it's telling me that's where I need to send the actual, uh, the, the assistance to. So ultimately if I'm masking that with ibuprofens and, and with uh, anti-inflammatories and the like, it's all it's going to do is actually prevent my recovery from going fast. So 
learn to deal a little bit with the pain. But that's a hard thing, you know, as somebody who uh, has experienced a lot of physical pain from sports activities myself, nothing at this level, by the way, but, you know, many injuries and breaks and, and, and being in critical situations where you get hurt. Um, and then I have an ongoing condition that, that, that fires, right, where my um, muscles can trigger and I have a horrible, um, horrible cramping. And so I'm on this... Um, uh, uh, epilepsy drug to control my nervous system to not irritate my muscles. Anyway, long story longer, I know exactly what it's like to be in that what feels like a very critical situation, Vaughn, and then in A, tremendous amount of pain, and B, um, you're in a situation where bad things can happen if you don't get out of that uh, situation. And so, I guess what I'm saying is I can understand how the sort of the combination of adrenaline and pain can get you through a high intensity type situation. Like when you were originally in the water and Craig had to get you out. The one that is uh, maybe a little harder for me to understand is, you know, when you're experiencing that pain, you're home, you're in your bedroom and there's a surge of pain for whatever reason. You get to that place where in your mind you think, I, I, I literally, I can't take any more of this pain. What did you do in those situations where your body is absolutely howling and yet you decided you don't want to take painkillers? Um, I'm a bit of a music fan. I love my certain bands and, and, you know, I suppose it's my meditation to a point rather than going into a chant. So, yeah, look, love my Pearl Jam, love... Um, a number of other bands love our ACDC back home in Australia. and uh, I, so, I got to love ACDC. I think they're the Ramones of heavy metal. Yeah. So music was it for me. Like I'd pretty much put the headphones on and I'd just go to that place. And, I'd, and so uh, you'd turn on Pearl Jam and ACDC loud when you were in pain? or well, it was loud as my wife would allow, but usually the headphones <laughs> would, be, would be sent up by courier up to the upstairs bedroom pretty quickly. And so if you want to listen to that, and did you do, I know when I'm in pain, I've, I've been taught um, a whole bunch of breathing techniques. Yeah, absolutely. Did that help? Did that as well. So, yeah, look, I think one thing with surfing, if you're surfing bigger waves, you, you actually can go through quite a few techniques to get your breathing up and to get oxygen into your body. And, um, yeah, look, that definitely helped. But I think beyond that, um, some people actually switch their head off. And for me, I, from the moment, like the day after I'd had the accident and got out of recovery from the surgery in Bali, I was back on the emails, back talking to clients, back talking to staff. I needed the world to know I wasn't dead and basically I wasn't going anywhere. So I think to occupy your mind and actually find that space as well helps with pain. Like I think a lot of people that just sit there and dwell in their pain and suffering, uh, their own worst enemy for that, you know. The other thing I love about your mindset, and I know this because I know you, you did not entertain the thought that this was the new normal or some permanent change in your life. Like when the doctor said to you, hey, Vaughn, you're probably not going to walk. And by definition, you're not going to surf. What did you say in your head? Um, no bloody way, probably, um, in typical Aussie fashion, but... Uh, it's too big an important part of my life. And I think I have some people go, why would you put yourself back in a position where that could happen again? Um, I've never looked at it like that. I've looked at it and got, as soon as my surgeon said, you should be strong enough, you are strong enough. You know, I looked at it. I mean, one of the difficult things was I mentioned before being cut open uh, like a cesarean section. I have so much having that happen twice. You're the only man I know that's had two cesarean sections. <laughs> but the respect I have for every lady on the planet that's had to have one. <laughs> well, and you didn't even have to deliver a baby. I know, I know. You but, just had to have the surgery. Yeah, but look, that that itself um, was the probably the biggest challenge getting back on a, on a surfboard, lying flat. And I think you take it for granted. You, you From the moment you learn to walk as a toddler, to uh, to the point that you actually lose all those muscles uh, that connect everything up downstairs. I mean, it, it's it's moving this way, it's moving that way. Like it's well, and even just to put your shoes on, you know, it's all these things that you just take for granted. That's all your body consciousness and all that time that that gives you the ability to step from one side to the other side quickly. Um, but like anything, if you move, you have to move through the pain point. 
Like I think a lot of people go, oh, that's painful. I'm not going to move through it. You know, you don't get better from a major injury and get all your range of movement back unless you push through that scar tissue, push through the pain. And that, look, it's a great, for me, it's actually helped me with my my, my work as well. You know, when things get tough and I mean, I've read a, a, um, quite a bit lately and, and it comes back to success for people and their ability to have grit and determination. You know, and if you line up three people that have got every chance the same and they've got everything else researched well and funded well and whatever, it, it comes down to grit. Like if you want to beat your competition, you need to grit down and you actually have to work harder for longer. You know, you have to work smarter for longer. Um, and for me, that's that's something that going to any kind of physical pain teaches you if you can overcome it. There's not much you can't do if you're prepared to educate yourself to basically educate those around you and motivate them and move forward. But so many of us are are crushed by our setbacks, are crushed by, crushed by our losses. And certainly, you know, we have, here's what I love about what you've achieved here, Vaughn. You had the perfect excuse, right? The, if you had said, hey, fuck it, I'm going to live myself in a wheelchair and I'm going to be addicted to opiates and I'm not really going to be able to walk and I'm not really going to be able to surf and I'm going to make the whole world kind of revolve around me and I'm just going to be this invalid. Um, there's not a person in the world that would have argued with you about that. And, and you could have been this, you could have spent the rest of your life as the recipient of a massive amount of sympathy. I think that's for people that make that decision. Um, they've actually given into themselves, and and ultimately, first, if you can control your own mind and your own expectations of your recovery, what in whatever that means, whether it's a drug addiction, whether it's uh, an injury, whether it's a major personal setback and a, a breakup of a relationship, or anything like that, if you can first ground zero things and accept the reality of today, like I, I have a, a big belief that that you have about one or two days shock to your system going, oh, well, this is going to set me back. I had all these other things planned, right? Now, you feel sorry for yourself for all the things you're about to miss out on, right? But people that actually get past adversity very quickly wipe, they'll write a list, right? And they'll go, what are all the things that I can still do myself, even now with my handicap or my disability? And then they'll actually get pretty good at delegating everything else that they can't do. Right? And at that point, once you define that list, your recovery starts. Up until the point you're still wallowing in self-pity and you haven't actually looked up from your hospital bed to get on with it. But the minute – and then, look, the big challenge then is realising there's all this stuff on that list that I probably shouldn't have been doing myself anyway. Let me keep that space open when I recover and actually put that into things like my kids, my wife, my staff, my friends. You know, there's – Sorry, are you a different CEO now than you were before your accident? Look, I think I'm harder but kinder. Hmm. Say more about that. Well, I think ultimately I, I, I don't want to waste time. I want to have clients that we love working with. I, I, I really have a – I don't know if I can say this, but we have a no dickhead client policy in the business. So one of the beautiful things about being in control of the business is we can sort of decide we're not working for the man or the corporation telling us you still have to deal with those guys. So, you know, a very close friend of mine, one of our board members, Rex Devantia, once taught me, cut the cloth. 10% of your clients every year, the, the, the biggest dicks to deal with, the worst payers, the most horrible people that you have to spend time with in a week, get rid of them. Open up that 10% to spend with great clients. Where does cut the cloth come from? Is that some Aussie it's thing? It's a Kiwi, so it's even weird. Oh, it's a Kiwi thing. I love how you guys all have these these funny expressions, and uh, I, I like to mix them all up. And so I don't remember where they came from, but like you know, stuff like uh, it, it, it's 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 blowing so hard it could blow the dog off a chain, right? You guys say that one. Well, not all of us. That, but I get that. That's a Steve Irwin thing, isn't it? Is that a Steve Irwin? And then and then there's something about. Uh, your mother-in-law's cold breath. There's one about that. And then there's another one about uh, it's blacker than a wolf's bum. <laughs> Do you know that one? And these are ones Al taught me, right? And But here's my problem. I don't remember the original ones because I mix them all yeah, up. Yeah. That's what I'm looking at. You're going, what? Yeah, because I so, so I take like two or three of them and mix them up and say, it's blowing so hard it would blow your mother-in-law's black ass off a chain. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I can't remember which Aussie expression started where, but anyway, I, I love I love all those great sayings that you guys have. Yeah. Uh, I have to say it's been interesting being in this week in the States because I feel that things are closing up a little bit between the way that the world used to be here and the culture here and then our culture back in Australia. What do you mean by closing up? Well, getting a lot, it's a lot more similar now doing business in America to it is doing business in Australia. I think the way the world is moving and the way technology is moving and the way that we're all able to listen to things like podcasts and, and take inspiration from people in different countries around the globe. Um, it's closing things up. And I think there's also the, the Oh, okay. That's what you mean. Yeah, exactly. It's making us closer, bringing us together, closing yeah. things up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And um, I'm not exactly sure why, maybe it's just cause I have Australian friends, but um Legends and Losers has done really well in Australia. Well, and I, I probably get an email a week from, from some Aussie about, uh, about Legends and Losers. Look, I think um, there's a whole thirst for, for knowledge and inspiration going on out there. And, and yeah. to be fair, I mean, I have to say I'm a bit of a fan, a, a big fan. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts. Um, you know, there's been some absolute inspiration in there. And, and um, thank you. I think there'd be a few of my staff that if they go back over the catalogue, they'll realise that quite a few of our initiatives have come from some of your guest speakers and, and the discussion and dialogue that you have. I think you have to be open to actually saying this is a great new idea. And as much as you might take it on completely and, and acknowledge the person that gave it, there's also how you tweak it a little bit to your own of course. world and sense of the world. and. You know, we took uh, quite a bit of inspiration out of your discussion around um, how to deal with millennials. Um, uh, what, what did you take out of that? Well, look, I, I probably looked at it and said there's a bit that we do that we don't tell um, all of our staff about that. But, I mean, obviously, the whole they love to know that their organisation has a social conscience. Um, I actually told all the staff the other week there's a big uh, famine obviously going on at the moment as a result of, of the, the war in Syria and how that's affecting other countries and, so we made a donation for every staff member that we have on board on their behalf. We actually donated to that many people to have uh, all their uh, food and living requirements taken care of um, for a, a month or two over in that conflict. So, But I let the staff know for the first time. Normally I wouldn't have said anything. I would have just done it. But I, and, So, and so hold, 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 let, me, let me interrupt you. I'm sorry, Vaughn. A, what motivated you to want to do that? And B, what motivated you to want to tell your team this time where maybe in the past you wouldn't have? Well, what motivated me to want to do it was a pretty good piece of direct marketing that came straight to me saying, can you help out with this? But then after hearing your program and, and obviously... What was, the, that, what was the charity that was reaching out to? Do you remember? It was Care Australia. Care Australia, so, yeah. yeah. But, but ultimately, uh, what made me then communicate outwardly to my staff was the discussion that you guys have had of saying, you know what, it's quite valuable to these guys of this age and generation to actually realise that their organisation's got a social conscience and that they care. That's right. That's you know? right. Yeah. Um, so the reaction I had from the staff around that was outstanding. And, um, you know. So you, you told your team that for every person in the company, you're essentially going to sponsor somebody who's having this crisis in Syria. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. And it's nice to do and it's nice to be able to do, but for them... I want them to understand that we're still an organisation that cares about people in another part of the world that's a whole lot less unlucky than we are. Oh, my God, right? It's like every day that we wake up, I just think, mm. there but for the grace of God, go go I. And the amazing thing is we didn't choose our parents. No. We didn't choose what country we were born in, right? We It could very well have been any of us. So that uh, it, it's very eye-opening and, and a very cool thing for you to, to go do and and in the past you wouldn't have told them you would have just done it look we've told our our children at home we have a we sponsor a child for each child that we have in australia and um the kids get to see the pictures and the drawings that get sent across and that's sort of cool for them because what what i don't want is having them look they are lucky where they live they're in a beautiful place in the world and great friends and great relationships and never have to worry about what food they're going to eat and where they're going to sleep. And But it's important for them to grow up knowing that there's others that aren't as lucky as that and that we all have a responsibility to do our bit for that. And, um, you know, I suppose you look at a lot of entrepreneurs, I think it's outstanding on what a lot of the big Silicon Valley um, CEOs and, 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 you know, masters of the universe do when it comes to charity. Um, we've got a guy called... 
Andrew Twiggy Forrest in Australia, who's a, a, a mineral exploration giant. And um, you guys have all the greatest fucking names. <laughs> Twiggy. Andrew Twiggy Forrest. Forrest. And From now on, I want to be Christopher Twiggy Lockhead. <laughs> Actually, the name I've wanted to be forever, ever, pretty much ever since I understood what the, this name meant. Uh, do you know what the LL in LL Cool J stands for? No. It stands for Ladies Love, <laughs> which I always thought was so awesome, LL Cool J, right? So from that point on, I've been trying to get people to call me LL Lockhead, but it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to catch on. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, Twiggy Forrest has basically set a massive example in Australia of saying, look, I've done really well in business from nothing and now I'm giving back. So he does a whole heap for the Indigenous community, all the Aboriginal community in Australia. Um, he also basically is just a very generous, philanthropic guy who just sets a, a great example. So, um, you know, I think that's that's something I look at now and go, we, you don't want to just make money. You actually want to actually create change. And, change and isn't it funny when you get to that place uh, where, you know, in the beginning when you're an entrepreneur as a young man, it's really just, can you make it? Can you build a business? Can you be successful? Can you design and dominate a category, which I want to get to with you in a sec. But isn't it interesting that for many of us, when you get to that place where you're taken care of and your family's taken care of, we start to look outside, right? Yeah. And look, I've got a little pet project at the moment that I'm um, working on. And look, I think you've got to take it steps that you can do at the time and do well, but um, nothing like uh, the great man I've just been talking about before, but I've got um, my home state, Tasmania is a little bit like um, how cold the water can be here in winter. Um, it's If you don't have a wetsuit, you don't surf. And Unfortunately, for a lot of underprivileged kids and families that probably aren't um, as stable as what I was lucky enough to grow up in, there's not the money and there's not the parenting going on to actually get them into a sport like surfing. So I'm lucky enough to work with a lot of the biggest surf brands in Australia and one of them, Billabong, are working with me at the moment. But we've, um, we've got a program going. Isn't, isn't, I hate to interrupt you, but isn't Billabong a great name? It is. Like you're, you're a marketing guy. It's just... These guys put the word bong in their brand name. Like, let's just start with that. I don't think that was the, uh, <laughs> maybe it was. Well, I don't know. You know, I, I have this uh, vision of them sitting around wanting to start the business and, you know, pa pa you passing. I was actually sitting around having a beer and said, hey, Bill, get me a bong. Yeah, no, I think it might have been something like that. Like, it don't, I don't know. Anyway, I, I digress. I, uh, so keep, keep, keep talking. So I'll tell you what we're doing. So basically we've got, 15 under 14 year old girls and 15 uh, boys, same age. Um, and what we're actually doing is uh, going to roll this out in the next couple of months. But we're working with a foundation called the Beacon Foundation down in Tasmania and they deal specifically with broken homes and kids that are from underprivileged backgrounds. They're going to qualify who these kids are. And I've asked the local community of surfers down in Tassie who said, if you donate 30 old surfboards. For every surfboard you donate, I'll give you the wetsuits. And then we've organised for the uh, the transport and the surf lessons and like. So the thought behind the whole idea is if we can free these kids from a fairly rough life at home where they can just get to the beach, they're equal in the water. And then it gives them a gift of surfing for life that they can actually move on with. It is it's something interesting you just said, they're equal in the water. One of the interesting things to me about surfing, uh, as distinct from, say, skiing, you know, my other kind of passion sport is um, you can't tell who the billionaires are in the water and who the, you know, barely employed people are. It doesn't matter how many surfboards you have. It comes in how many waves you catch and how much fun you have. Uh, that, that's right. And so it's impossible to uh, it, 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 it changes everything because even like you would think in surfing, maybe you'd be able to differentiate yourself by having like some super expensive sur surfboard or super snazzy wetsuit. But, you know, that's not really how surfing works, right? And so you don't judge people on what they're wearing or their equipment. No. It, it, it's an interesting thing in that regard, because if you go, if you go skiing years ago, I was in St. Moritz uh, skiing. And have you ever been there, Vaughn? No, I've heard about it. Sounds fabulous. Well, it is fabulous. I mean, and Switzerland is... Uh, and the Alps, of course. But the interesting thing about St. Moritz is, holy super ding dong. Like, 
everything's wading dong. I mean, they still wear fur and there's all this and, and on the mountain, they do it. Like it's the, it feels like to me, like the 1970s where, you know, they've got the tight pants and the furry shit. <laughs> it's a fashion show. Yep. It's a very expensive fashion show. Uh, there's no equivalent to that in the surfing. You're just in the water. Look, I think that's the the best thing about it. Like ultimately, it's like you know, the, you hear the old adage of when you're at the bar having a drink, no one looks at your car in the car park. And um, you know, for me, I love the fact that we're all equal in the water, and it comes down to I have more respect for the people that are actually encouraging and kind and actually share their advice. I mean, I know we had a situation when I first met you in Fiji that um, you know you were surfing away and doing a good job, but there was just a couple of little tips that I could give you at the time. And uh, uh, it was more than a couple, but, but thank you. Yeah. But you know, the, at the end of the day, I suppose it's with life really. Like if you hold everything so close to your chest that you don't want to actually give people the secret herbs and spices and hold them all to yourself, you'll live a fairly sad life. I mean, if you can help people with a bit of advice, like what you guys are doing with this, this show, um, for me, that's amazing. Like it, it ultimately helps people get out of bed with a different perspective and actually look at their world and say, how do I make it a better place and how do I teach my kids how to be better people and how do I actually encourage my friends if they're feeling a bit flattened down and depressed? Yeah, I th- obviously, I think all that's really important and sort of this may sound like a stupid thing to say, but it's gotten clearer and clearer to me, um, particularly having written Play Bigger and, and now doing Legends and Losers. What we put into our mind is what we get out of our life. Absolutely. Right. It really is the ideas and the thoughts and the people who are sharing those ideas and thoughts, whether we're reading them or consuming them on a podcast or just hanging out like you and I like to. Um, what goes into our brains is what we get out of our life. It's really like the oxygen uh, that fuels our muscles. The ideas and the thinking and the conversations and the dialogues and the learning that we have is what dictates um, you know, where, where we land, what we think about in life. And I think too, I mean, you come back to that all important thing of having a few life mentors, whether they be younger than you and or older than you and how you look at it. But I've been really appreciating of late all the people that have probably got 20, 30 years around the sun on me, actually taking the time to actually talk to me about what made them, you know, what actually helped them in their life. You know, it's amazing how much old people don't want to talk to people that don't care. But the minute they're actually aware that they've got somebody around them that actually is going to really cherish that information and do the right yeah. thing with it, they're so open to it. Have you learned anything really cool in that regard lately you want to tell me about? Oh, look, nothing in particular that springs to mind. I mean, I think just the whole kindness factor. Like, you know, at the end of the day, what does it cost you to be kind to somebody? You know, it's interesting that you use that word. So, um, and to sort of... T- to connect it to a business, words matter. And that's why we're so uh, adamant about having a dialogue with entrepreneurs and executives about this notion called the point of view and languaging and so forth. And that word kindness. So my uh, father-in-law, Phil, just recently had pretty significant uh, surgery and he's doing great, which is is incredible. Um, And, um, the facility that he was at Vaughn is just here in Santa Cruz. It's called Dominican hospital and they're part of a network and um, the networks uh, mantra, their tagline and they use it in their marketing is hello, human kindness. Mm. And it's everywhere. The words kindness or, or the term hello, human kindness are, are literally on the elevator doors at Dominican hospital and it's on the badges of, of the doctors and nurses and so on. And it's interesting. They were extraordinarily kind to Phil. Mm. And it, it just shows you how powerful a, what we were just talking about is what we put into our mind affects our behavior, affects our life. And B from a purely business point of view, if you center your company on a powerful point of view and you use that as your, not just your marketing category design, but as your, sort of true north for how you govern the business, it changes everything. Look, I think um, reading the work that you guys have done with Play Bigger, um, I have to say it resonated massively with me and how we try to go about work. I mean, we have an interesting role and job sometimes where we actually don't work in one business, we work in 50 if you consider our clients' businesses our businesses like we do. 
Sure, so of my course. My job is almost to help them finding that gap, that space, that point of difference um, in their business models. And at the same time, sometimes we've forgotten to do that for ourselves. We've just gone along and said, you know, we've been really good at what we do to a degree at our stage and space and territory. Um, but I got very motivated after I read your book and, um, you know, I looked at the whole category design thing and actually said, you know what, there's a gap in our model at the moment, the the, the media strategy and media buying space. Um, I believe we should be doing a whole lot more in terms of using information science and actually gathering the data and interpreting it quickly and, and actually aligning the business and the like. So we've actually created uh, what we believe is, is a, a new way of doing things and, you know, we've called that informatic communication investment. Informatic uh, communication investment. That's right. And what's informatic communication investment about, Vaughn? Well, it's all about basically, first of all, actually diagnosing statistically what has worked. So doing a back fetch for a number of You mean years. we don't want to just have a, a bullshit opinion-based discussion about what's working in marketing? Well, <laughs> I, I think to be fair, the, the decision-making structure has been about let's get the smartest person in the room let them tell us what strategy we should define. And to me, regardless of how good you are at doing that, it's still not how the process should be. The process should be how do you actually analyze all of this data that you've got that's actually very valuable, but bring it back in a way that you can then actually make some decisions from it. So, And, and when you say data, you mean data about what's working and what's not working in your marketing. Is, client, that, is that fair to I mean, say? It really comes back to saying to a client straight up, what's your data capture? Do you actually capture your sales data or your interactions with customers and the, where they are? What what software do you use? What systems do you use? How do you do that? And part of that is... But you I'm sound talking. like an IT guy. I mean, you're a marketing guy. You're an advertising guy. Well, I suppose I'm burning our boat at the shore saying we need to do that now. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't be doing it the old way. We should actually be putting... And look, I've been working very closely with um, a great university in Australia called Bond University on a program. We're actually funding a PhD student in the informatics department at the moment to work specifically on this project with us. We've already created our model to, for backfetch and we're actually improving that. Um, and I've been here in Silicon Valley in the last week working with a great company um, in terms of, uh, you know, they've got some very, I think, uh, progressive ideas and they've got some great technology that ultimately I could have spent years trying to formulate something even similar and not have got close. But we've uh, had a good collaboration and we're going to be joining forces a little bit with them. So, And so uh, at a high level today, Vaughn, how do you think about the inner, inner uh, play between the creative side of marketing and advertising, the media buying side, because you were one of the first boutique agencies in Australia to combine those two, right? Which is pretty differentiated even to this day. Yep. But now you're adding this whole information, um, technology, visibility, measurement capability to um, the marketing work. So how do you think about the integration of creative, media buying, and now the informatics and, and data capture? Well, I think... My big point of it is, and where we've been working really hard, is aligning all the traditional media channels up with the digital. The digital is reasonably easy because if you've got a digital business model, it's all taggable. You can bring it all back into a fairly easy dashboard and actually read what was my you know, CPA, what was my CPM, what was my, you know, all the metrics that you want to look at from that side, you can pull in and pretty quickly say it was a fail or it was a win. The issue then being is, you can't do the same in this day and age with traditional just quite yet. Um, so we're trying to bring that online. If we can do that, for me, it's our way of actually beating the whole Henry Ford, 50% of my my advertising works. I just don't know which 50%. So what I'm trying to say is line them all up fairly. Don't orphan off all the traditional media like television, radio, print, um, catalogue. You know, they've still got their place. And for what we're finding now more than ever is – People that get so stuck in the digital realm will actually do it to their detriment. You know, they will they will bring in prospects and then they will retarget those prospects to the point those prospects don't want to even touch that brand any further. Just because they've been hammering them with digital shit? Yep. And then they'll find out the hard way that using digital for prospecting is quite expensive. You know, when you can go above the line sometimes and actually get the right quality audience um, a whole lot cheaper. So for me, that, that's, that's subjective, right? And that's sometimes a, a gut feel thing and we can prove that by actually trialing that in one state, one market and, or one campaign. But what I want to do and what we are doing 
now is moving to a point where I can actually very quickly tell our clients that campaign is absolutely flying on that channel. Let's amp it up. Let's spend more in that channel and just take less out of the one that's not performing. So it's almost going to a stock market model of actually trading strategy. Yeah, based and on what's working in, in, if not real time, close to real time. Correct. And the important thing about moving to a live framework is the, the reality of, of competitive changes, environmental shifts, political, geopolitical implications. All these things will affect what the strategy worked last month won't possibly work three months from now, but you need yeah. to pick it quick. Yeah. You know, and sometimes it's a case of when we have a situation when we had a federal election in Australia last year and we also had the Olympics and they fell within two months of each other. And we pretty much advised all of our clients if you can't afford to advertise around the Olympic coverage, stay out, stay out and, and sit on your money for a couple of months. Now, it wasn't great for us as a business. It probably got us off to a fairly crummy start for last year, but it was the right advice. You know, sometimes it is hold them, you know, and sometimes it's show them. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like in boxing, right? There's two parts, hitting and not getting hit. Yeah. And the not getting hit part is really important. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a bit of a theory about, about uh, and it's a bit out there, this is a, but I've got an orange and shot put theory. Uh, 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 a What? I call it the orange and the shot put theory. Orange and shot put theory. All right. What's on the orange? So they're both obviously about the size of an orange. One of them is very hard. One of them is not so hard, but it's got a slightly tough skin on the outside. All right. And if you took a needle and at the wrong time, if it's a shot put market, the market's not going to let you go through that thing. It's a blump of steel, right? But you'll just blunt your needle trying to keep throwing advertising marketing activity at it to the point that the needle is so blunt that when the market conditions change and it goes from the continuum of a shot put back to an orange, that thing is so blunt that it won't even go to the skin of an orange. Then you've got to go off and think about your strategy and refine your act and basically get the right people and the right staff, get your needle sharp again. But then you have to be smart enough to go, is the market a shot put or an orange? Because the only way you move forward is to get to the centre of that sphere and move forward. So how, how do you tell if I'm a CMO or an entrepreneur or CEO, how do I know whether my market currently is a shot put or an orange? Well, you need to look at your stats and data. You need to look very quickly and say, you know, uh, are we slowing down from doing everything we're doing right now? The strategy is actually coming off the boil. So if we keep banging away and throwing more money at that, we're actually taking our needle to the shot put. You know, it's interesting because in, in Play Bigger, the book, we say... Um, it's about prosecuting the magic triangle, right? Product, company, and category. And that something legendary happens when the right people attack the right category at the right time. Yep. But that timing piece matters. And we had uh, Eric Yuan, the founder of Zoom uh, Communications on Legends and Losers not long ago. And he was talking about the importance of timing, that if, if they had been early the technology wouldn't have been there. There wouldn't have been the market receptivity. And he said, if they were starting Zoom today, they'd be so far behind, they wouldn't have a chance. Is that what you're talking about? Look, it is. And look, I'll footnote that whole principle to say, sometimes 60% well executed fast is enough. You know? And, yeah. And look, we created our whole business name and called it Rapid Media for one reason. Rapid response to clients, rapid results. Basically, I'd rather actually not die wondering and deploy rather than when, you know, if, if we've got clients in, in a category where they're old and, and cumbersome competitors, we just smash them. We throw three things out here as a strategy to actually make them think that's where we're going and then we'll do the blitz over here. And how, particularly as you now think about category design, um, how do you think about differentiating yourself and designing your own category for rapid media against your competitors? Well, look, to be fair, um, I'm two years into the process of having a head around informatic communications investment. So as far as I'm concerned, there is no so much focus on rapid media anymore. There's the focus of actually leading this category in this direction. Right? Yeah. I, I want to make media buying something that used to happen. I mm. want to actually make informatic communications investment what we should be doing. 
Interesting. Now, a couple of years ago, um, you um, did something that's a huge step for entrepreneurs, which is you took in some outside investment. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that? Look, we've been very lucky. We've got um, WPP, which is one of the bigger global um, companies in, in our space. So, um, look, I was fortunate. We've had a long-term business relationship with the guys. So, they... so you're the guppy and they're the whale, right? 100%. Yeah. But you... you you defined a very tight niche that you could dominate, uh, particularly around your creative, which is amazing, and, and, and the integration of creative and media buying. Did you not? Look, our main point of difference, I suppose, is a, it's a human thing. It's a person thing. So a lot of the bigger agencies um, will basically come and pitch for your business and the guy that comes and pitches and gives you his card, it's the last time you'll ever see him again. You know, basically you had the A grade pitch and now you get the D or E grade implementation so <laughs> we've been very upfront with our clients from the get-go I mean you know we have a senior service offering um, the guy that pretty much takes your brief is the guy that then negotiates with the media so we've got fantastic relationships with our, our media proprietors in Australia like all the television networks the radio networks the print guys right um, we treat them like gold we don't basically treat it like they owe us a living and we spend all of our clients money with you that's basically any free concert tickets to Lady Gaga go to client and basically if we take the media out, we pay for lunch. So we, um, <laughs> we've probably turned that one on its head a little bit from the way it goes with others. But look, well, and, and I love that. The thing I've never understood about the advertising business um, and the event marketing business is the client will create a creative brief and say, we're doing this thing or this campaign or this event, whatever it is. And we want you as an agency to come in and present your creative ideas, your strategic ideas and your media buying plan. And we expect you to do all that shit for free. Look, it's... And, and to me, I hate to cut you off, but that's a great example of category design. That is to say, Somebody decided early on in the marketing business and the advertising business that this was how we were going to play. And everybody then just like penguins off the fucking iceberg just does the same thing. And, and, and you don't do that, right? Well, look, we generally don't. Yeah. Um, we definitely don't. If you came to me tomorrow and said, can you create me a television commercial, which we love doing, like any person creatively that likes writing out a script, creating a storyboard and bringing it to life. That's fun, all right? But we won't do that anymore if we don't do your media. So the answer to a business that says, can you come and create these creative assets for me? It's like, if you give me the media as well as the creative, then we'll do it, all right? But if I do that and I just take more time up, I'm not spending it back on our clients that we offer that proposition to right. over here. So it's a bit of a respect thing to our current client stable as well as, you know, just to the business to say that's our direction. But Look, but that is so against what the industry says to do, right? And clients expect you to come in and show them all this free shit. Well, I think any business that defines the culture of their business by the clients that they'll, if they just, it's an open door policy for any client to walk in and get serviced, that's the start of the end. You know, you have to be just selective, <laughs> just as selective about the client that you're taking on as the way that they're choosing you as a business to work with. Um, and, and to me, that is category design. You are saying these types of people are in and these types of people are out. Well, if you're a surfer and you've got a media budget, I'd like to talk to you because I actually have a whole <laughs> lot in common. And we actually find a lot of our clients uh, that way is, is a common interest outside of work work. Yeah. Um, that's a, a lovely thing to have. But at the, at the same time, it comes back to the, the, the quality of the people. You know, you'll get... The situation, and we we have to tell you, we're very in a good space at the moment with our client base, and we love our clients. And there's not too many that we have an issue and, with. And, and remind me who some of your clients are, Ron. Yeah, because you got some amazing clients. Oh, look, I mean, to be fair, not to call them all out or whatever, but if yeah. anyone's interested, they can look at the website and see. Yeah, okay, clients. but I mean, you, you work with some of the biggest brands in the world look, and, and some I mean, of the biggest I mean, brands in Australia. Yeah, I mean, probably to call one out, it's been. Um, been very good to us over the years and we're just doing more with them as a brand is, is now Flight Center, which is a big global travel client. Um, yeah. They've got a number of brands that we're doing some work with. Um, it, look, we absolutely love our clients. At the end of the day, they are the one that pay the bills, keep the lights on, do whatever else, but we're having fun doing it with them. And, and I, look, I think my new direction for the business and what the, my team's grasping onto is what we're doing with informatic communication investment. That's a massive upgrade for every one of our clients and for anyone else that comes on board. I mean, to put 
proper strategy. Um, you know, and I suppose look, everyone's buzzwording the whole machine learning and AI thing, right? It, the reality is if you can actually take a, a job that a human would take a week to do and do it in half a, an hour and actually come up with a real actionable insight and a recommendation, um, that's got to be a good thing, especially if you're dealing with, you, on behalf of your clients, if their competitors have got nothing like that. Yeah. You just changed the game. You just made that a massive strategic advantage. I mean, I, I have a real issue with people that just go, oh, my agency's okay. Yeah. I just go, well, if you're going to think like that, why didn't you think about putting the best boxer into the into the actual ring for you? Yeah. I mean, to me, it's quite pathetic that people sit there and go, they don't service me well, they treat me like a number, you know, they don't get back to me within an hour, they get back to me 48 hours later. I mean, to me, that's Why do you tolerate the, it? It's the business basics that you just go, if you act like that, I mean, I would love it if... if for my clients, if their if their competitors had agencies that act like that, which a few of them do, that's just manna from heaven. Like that's just <laughs> you're already starting behind me before we've started to run. And the other thing I love about what you're doing is, uh, you know, here you are in Australia, and you're here in Silicon Valley. You're building relationships with technology providers here, and from a category design point of view, you essentially are telling software and technology companies in Silicon Valley, how they fit inside your category design, as opposed to what normally happens if you're a dealer or a reseller or a consultancy or an agency and you're partnered with a technology firm, they sort of say, well, this is the vision for the category and you play in our, our ecosystem. You're actually, as a small agency, flipping that on its side saying, no, this is our category design. This is our point of view. This is how we think the ecosystem for this category works. And you play in our world, not we play in your world. Essentially, that's what you're doing, isn't it? In a much more humble fashion, I would hope. I mean, we've worked for two years um, and put a lot of work into what we believe is is a great direction. And uh, to be fair, the, the guys I met this week, I think were they've done a lot more investment into what they're doing and you know they're very very smart guys that are uh, and lovely people um but i pretty much am happy to say to them take everything i've learned over here and all these thoughts from this angle and basically if you can get benefit out of that then let's do it so for me and and you and i talked a little bit about that when um when dennis boyle was on legends and losers with his wife peggy burke one of the things Dennis was talking about at IDEO is how IDEO just continuously has given away their intellectual property, their intellectual capital. Well, why do you think that's a good idea for, for rapid media? It's only a bad idea if you don't think you're going to not have another better idea. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, you know, without, um, I honestly believe that you should always keep moving forward and you should keep thinking that there needs to be another evolution moving forward. And that's part of, I suppose, if you want to create a category from what you guys have taught me, um, that's the basic principle of it. I mean, you're actually, as a category leader, you have a responsibility to actually evolve. Um, And you need to keep looking at your weaknesses and you need to actually look at it and go, how could I do that better? And part of that sometimes is the compromise of saying, it's not an ego to actually say somebody else is so far more advanced with this technology that I need to make a relationship there and actually work with these people because that's going to get me from point A to point B for my clients a whole lot quicker. I mean, for me, make a better system, make a better model, implement it, get the results. To me, that's the holy grail. Like I, That's the promise I'm promising everyone right. of my clients. Right. And, and I suppose it gets back to that point. If your agency, agencies can be horrible things, right? They seem to be like this oracle <laughs> of tell me everything I should know about my business, right? That's not what we do. You know, what, what, we, what we should be doing is actually um, bringing great ideas to the table and actually analysing briefs and actually coming back with a better response than the next guy could ever come back with that suits the business at the time. Um, and if you can actually create a tool and, and, and a process and a system, um, and look, we're going to give our clients the same view on this technology that we have. Uh, you know, once they buy into the, the, the actual whole informatic communication investment idea, I'm not sitting there saying well, only I can drive that for you and I want to get paid so much to do it. I'm actually saying, hey, awesome, now you're actually buying into this. Now we can do some really cool things together. Like we can look at things and say let's try something completely wacky as a activation over here and, you know, if it then fires up on the numbers and shows that was the gold, then we'd do more of that. You know, if, if it's a case of going back to a, a strategy that was done by Ogilvy many, many moons ago, 
and it's still brilliant because it was brilliant then. And it's brilliant. God, God bless David Ogilvy. Yeah. And look, I'm, I love all his work, and I think he's been the godfather of my industry. And and uh, I, uh, he has been for me. And yeah. Ogilvy on advertising is one of the most important books I ever read. Yeah, but you know, for me, it's about in your own life personally, and about in your business life. I mean, who wants to work for somebody that's not thinking through what's the next step for, I mean, I can tell you right now, there's lots of other companies that have a much better stock fridge and employee benefits than us, but I hope I'm quite inspiring. Sometimes you mean you didn't, stuff. you didn't build a Disney world for your employees well, to I, hang out at? I find that a bit crazy sometimes, like at the end of the day, you know, and I get it that um, competition's tough. You've got to give these millennials what they want. They want their Twinkies and their, you know, and their craft beer in the, in the work fridge. But for me, it's like, guys, let me give you the real carrot. You know, you can share in the success of this and I'm going to be generous with you if we can make this work. And um, ultimately, what would an employer really want? Greater take-home pay, um, greater pre- career progression or basically all the benefits of, of a fully stocked fridge. Yeah, and work on great stuff, right? Yeah. So, Bon, you're also a deeply committed uh, husband and dad. What does it mean to you to be a husband and a dad? Oh, look, at easy to answer. Um, it's the most important aspect of my life. I absolutely love my wife, Katrina, and we're blessed to have uh, four beautiful children. So I've got Oliver, my 10-year-old boy. Um, I've got Anastasia, my 8-year-old daughter. Little Zara is three, and we call her the tornado. She's um, <laughs> Your three-year-old is the tornado? She's the tornado. And then uh, we've got Coco Rose. It's our beautiful little six-month-old baby girl. So, um, so you have four under the age of 10. Mm. What's that like, Vaughn? Look, um, it's probably the most beautiful thing ever when uh, they all routinely, uh, we have a bit of a policy in the morning that they, they aren't really meant to wake up before six o'clock for the kids that know any better. And, but they wake up right on the dot. It's almost like you don't have to set an alarm clock and they'll filter into the bedroom. So they'll end up the whole family. We had to almost have a bigger custom made bed made so that all of us can pile in and, and watch. So they all crawl into bed with uh... yeah. and And then invariably it's a little bit, we have a rule that the youngest gets to choose the, the, the show. So, um, the big kids aren't in there for watching the television. They're in there for catching up with mum and dad. But, yeah, we all have to watch a fair amount of SpongeBob on repeat, unfortunately. Coco Rose likes SpongeBob? Who likes SpongeBob? Oh, no, Zara. Zara likes yeah, SpongeBob. She's the queen of the so she's, she's, picking, she's picking it. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny technology. I mean, she already can navigate the remote control with Netflix. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And isn't it amazing the first time a child that age says to you, what's your password for iTunes or something like that? Because they, they're, they're now trying to buy something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but look, um, the absolute um, purpose of my world are my family and, and beyond my immediate family. I'm very close to my nuclear, my family, what I grew up in. So my parents and my brother and sister um, and their siblings. So, yeah, look, we're... we're uh, we very much are trying to live the life where we're not all splitting off in different directions. We, we are there for each other through good and bad. And, um, yeah, look, uh, my whole thing with, uh, my sister's an amazing artist and she's a teacher. I'm very proud of her and what she does. Um, my brother's been a great sportsman. He puts a lot back in now to junior football development. He's, he had more players. He had six out of the top 10 in the AFL draft last year came out of his program. So that's like with your gridiron, um, imagine that, having one feeder team supply the top 10, 60%. So he's very good at what he does. I just Anyone out there listening wants to give him an amazing general management job back in Australia. You know. <laughs> and the uh, beyond just sort of your love and commitment to your family, which, you know, I know how significant it is. The thing I love about it from a sort of legendary life design, legendary work design perspective is you've designed those things together, right? So you, you don't live in Melbourne or in Sydney. No, look, I, I actually don't live with most of my, in the same town as most of my staff. So we've, we've decentralized our model. Um, we've got small little micro offices popped up. We've got one in Brisbane. We've got one on the Gold Coast. Um, one in my hometown at Lennox Head, um, which is just next to Byron Bay. And then we've got Melbourne. Um, so, but ultimately, we have the approach of get good people and let them live where they want to live. And um, clients these days, as long as you're receptive and, and responsive, 
to their requirements. I mean, you don't need your agency in your office every second day, every week. I mean, to me, it's it's actually uh, it's counterproductive. It, it's so fascinating to hear you say that. Uh, I have a good buddy who lives here in Santa Cruz who runs a boutique agency that's very differentiated. He's done incredibly well for many, many years. And he opened an office in San Francisco because he thought, well, you know, a lot of his clients were up there and he thought, if I have an office there, they'll come visit me and we can do this stuff together and so forth and so on. And so he goes ahead and he does that beautiful, incredible place, you know, uh, at the height of the real estate market very recently in San Francisco. And in less than a year, he shut it. Yep. And the reason he shut it is exactly the point you're on. He said, uh, it was beautiful. And we had a few people come every once in a while, but the reality is nobody wants to come. The clients are too busy doing their thing. And to your point, you know, the employees can work from anywhere. Well, I look, even flipping in the coin the other way, I mean, part of our most important work we do with clients is actually having a proper sit down one or two day session with them where we go through their business, understand their objectives, understand everything that makes their world tick. Um, and doing that in their environment's horrible. They've, you've got their assistants coming in, you have something happen in the finance department and key people have to leave the room. Um, so look, we purposely built our new office at Lennox Head right on the ocean, um, pretty much with a, a, a state-of-the-art conferencing um, boardroom set up in there. So we actually offer to fly our clients up for strategy on us. Um, it's 15 minutes from the airport. It's a two-hour flight from Melbourne and one-hour flight from Sydney. It's just the perfect environment to actually sit down and have their head out of their world working on their business. So that whole adage of working on your business rather than in it, yeah, you need to create that paradigm, and sometimes the best thing to do is just offer to pay, <laughs> like um, <laughs> to get them out of their own conference room or their own office. Yeah, and- but getting back to that life balance thing too. I mean, for me, I don't want to be living with my family um, two days out of every seven. So for me, if if my clients are happy to fly to us another two of those days, and I've basically bridged the gap where I'm only away every second week, you know. And look, my, my and what I what I love. I hate to interrupt you, Vaughn, but what I love is you've made decisions for your business and your life like they're the same thing because they are. You know, this whole work-life balance discussion contextually drives me nuts because it makes a suggestion just in the way it's sort of presented that you got work over here and your life over here and you're trying to balance them. And what I've experienced is the most legendary people I know say, who am I? What do I want to do in life? What's the difference I can make? What's the problem I can solve? What's the fun I want to have? Uh, What are the things I want to achieve, et cetera? And then they design their life and their business in that context because your motivations for rapid media are the same as your motivations in your life, right? And so, yeah, and and sorry to interrupt there, but the, uh, the adage of your staff and your children they're very similar to me. You know, ultimately, I want to care for my staff the same feelings in terms of seeing them go forward and actually develop, whether that's with us or whether that's beyond us. Um, but, you know, I'll give you a prime example. We have staff invariably say, oh, I want to work in the Brisbane office and I'm basically, you know, I'm in the Gold Coast. You know, it might be they have a partner move markets and whatever. Similar to your freeway here on peak hour on a Friday night, um, that means they're going to probably spend three hours of every day stuck in a car, traveling an hour. Um, and I'll just say to them, this is not going to work. Like ultimately you need to to think about this, whether you want to stay working with us or work somewhere else. But as a human being, you need to spend that three hours a day with your family while there's still sunlight hours or going to the gym or doing an art class or playing a guitar or you don't want to be driving a car. It's so funny you say that because – there have been multiple times in my life where I've had an hour and a half to two hour commutes twice a day, right? And then when you take that out of your life, holy shit, is it ever transformative? Absolutely. And, and look, I think the other thing is being mindful of what life stage your staff are in. You know, if they've had their first baby, the, the, the actual kids in the office need to understand that that person's going to be tired, grumpy, sleep deprived. I'll actually call them in and say, guys, we need to give them a bit. We call it a chop out in Australia. We need to uh, give them a bit of a chop out here. A chop out? Them. What's a chop out? It just means we need to look after this person a little bit. We need to be a bit more tolerant with them. I mean, people go through all those stages and and, and, and ultimately 
as a uh, getting better, I, I've never ever put the shingle up to say I'm the world's best manager. I try to be a great leader, right? I probably have got to the point other people are better at the day-to-day management thing, but I, I do care about them, you know, and if I can see them struggling because there's some aspect of their life that you would go, that's not work-related, then there's the tap on the shoulder and the uncomfortable, I suppose, direct discussion around, hey, you know, I mean, we we have guys in winter, you know, one small office, basically, one person gets influenza, the whole office goes down, we get blown up. <laughs> so last yeah. year, I said to them, guys, I'm, I'm giving you a dietitian coming in for half a day, cancel all your appointments, you're going to be taught how to go to the grocery store and buy the good things to put in your body and how to cook it and what to have and how to balance all that out. I said, I'm not, I know you're not going to stop getting drinks on a Friday night, Saturday night, doing whatever you're going to do, but at least we can put some of the goodness in. It means there's not nothing left in the tank at the end of it. But, you know, you have, I I love it. you've love you got a little bit of a responsibility to say, hey, create some balance in your own life and, and, you know, you can be doing an amazingly good job at your career, but you're not seeing your friends and you're unhappy and, you know, you, you might be – you're cutting back. You can only grow the spokes at the same um, That's right. size to make the wheel run smooth, you know? Well, and our lives are one. I guess this is my complaint. Our lives are one indivisible whole. You're not a different person at work than you are at home. It's no. just you are Bond. Look, I, I think the other thing is just teaching your children about business a little bit. I mean, I, all my clients are pretty cool with the fact that they'll invariably get me in the car with the toddler, the kids. They all get asked invariably to say hello um it's in it's fairly regular that the kids will call into the office at three o'clock after school when we're still going for two or three hours you know yeah sure they know just to come and sit quietly on the floor and they'll get their chance to say hello yeah but for me it's um shouldn't be like having a lot more parents actually outsource and work from home now it should be normal for children to actually understand that mum and dad have to make the money this is what we have to do it's good for them to see right you saw it as a child absolutely Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the more children can be given purpose. I mean, we, uh, our 10 year old, probably from chores perspective, we're trying to teach him at the moment that you have to finish a job. Um, I'll tell you a story. It's quite interesting that he gets a little bit of stick at school because he, he actually is a good saver. He gets a little bit of stick at school. What does that, what does that mean? He got a little bit of bullying. Is that the word here? The oh word? yeah. So, so kids were bullying him. Just one particular kid had it. Okay. Him, but basically he, uh, he said, Oh, your dad drives a nice car. And you know, Oliver's response was my dad works very hard, works not many hours and he can buy whatever he wants with his money. So that would sort of be my stock standard reply. To him. <laughs> but it's always someone better off. There's always someone worse off. So anyway, he, he gets paid his pocket money every week to clean up after our two giant labradoodles. But he only gets paid if he cleans up the seven days. If he actually gets to day five and then decides to go skating and doesn't do his job, then he doesn't get paid. But for six months, he saved up for a, uh, saved up for a brand new surfboard and it was his pride and joy and he's in the social age now. So he's on Instagram and he's basically – put up the picture of his pride and joy on Instagram and same kid corners him at school. You're so spoiled. Your parents bought you and others. He goes, I had to clean up dog shit for six months to pay for this surfboard. My dad said I can buy whatever I want with my own money. (laughs) So what did the bully say? He backed off at that point. So I think, you know, I think it's important for people to understand if the, if they've worked hard to actually deserve what they have as long as they've got a bit of a heart out there and are giving to other people there, should, there shouldn't be any embarrassment about actually having nice things creating a nice life doing better but kids need to learn that yeah it's it's so interesting and i know it's a cliche but uh it's a lot different when you earn your shit than when it gets given to you a lot different yeah you know look we all need help and we all need people who can give us things so uh those are wonderful gifts and 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 uh, when somebody gives us something that makes a big difference for us and can help us move forward in our life, that's awesome. And to your point, when you've got to, uh, you know, shovel shit for six months to earn your surfboard, you're learning a thing or two, right? There's a bit more to him. <laughs> well, Vaughn, is there anything else you'd like to touch on before we kick out of this wave? No, I just was going to say what a lovely part of the world it is here. I haven't been lucky enough to be to Santa Cruz before and, and, uh, yeah, the whole of California. I think Americans are very friendly 
to Australians. I think we've got a great, I mean, regardless of hearing all the politicians go wah, wah, wah about the relationship between the two countries. I mean, I love my American friends and, you know, it's just such a pleasure to catch up and, and obviously your hospitality has been amazing and Carrie and just thank you. Well, well, you're welcome. And it's so great to have you here. And, you know, the whole time you've been here, I look at you and go, fucking hey, we met like over a decade ago on a remote island and uh, and here we are. And, you know, you've been in my life pretty much ever since then. And to watch you as an entrepreneur, to watch you grow as a father and a husband, um, you know, the fact that we're both in the same field in marketing. Um, now you're working with technology companies in Silicon Valley that we know. That's really cool. And, and we got to surf together. Yeah, we did. And that was pretty awesome. But, you know, I think on that too, you've been very open with your contacts book and your advice. And, and you know, in many ways, so you've got how many years? You got close to 30. Yeah, well, yeah. I was going to say between my Actually, age, 31 between technically now. Age, you've got a few years on me, but you're very generous to act like a big brother figure. The well, you thank you. And, and thank you. Well, Vaughn, you're an awesome guy. I love you. I'm so glad you came for a visit and your business and your life is an inspiration. And I really want to thank you for having this dialogue today. All right. Well, this sets a great target for me now to live up to. You've got to make this category fly, hey? you got to be the guy you just said you are. <laughs> Thanks, Vaughn. Thank you very much. Love you, buddy. Well, there he is, Vaughn O'Connor. If, uh, if that doesn't get you inspired and fired up, I don't know what will. Um, if there's somebody in your life who you think would love this episode, why not share it with them? Well, there he is, Vaughn O'Connor. If, uh, if that doesn't get you inspired and fired up, I don't know what will. Um, if there's somebody in your life who you think would love this episode, why not share it with them right now? Speaking of right now, I'd like to share with you uh, three legendary events that I am privileged to be participating in, in no particular order, on September 6th in San Francisco from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the dog patch with my good friends at Wildcat Ventures, uh, one of the thought leaders in venture capital in Silicon Valley, my dear buddy, uh, uh, Bruce Cleveland, who I've known for over tw uh, yeah, 20 years. <laughs> Geez, you know, when you're not paying attention, 20 years goes by really fast, doesn't it, Bruce? Uh, so we're doing this event called How Legends Design and Dominate Categories. Uh, I'll be signing copies of Play Bigger. Bruce and I will be talking, and um, we'll be hanging out with some movers, shakers, and, and uh, super ding-dong executive entrepreneurs and executives um, and uh, the like <laughs> in San Francisco, September 6th. So to request your VIP invitation, blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. Send us an email, blackhole at legendsandlosers.com, and we will get you set up. One Life Fully Lived, our annual event in Sacramento is, no, is October 21 and 22, October 21 and 22 in California's capital, Sacramento. So come out, hang out with us, dream plan and live your best life. Meet Tim Rode, the founder. Meet my buddy Bix Bixen. Uh, meet Brian Rocha, the managing whatever he's called these days of, of One Life Fully Lived and a group of motivated, focused, alive people who are uh, in the process of designing a legendary life and a legendary business. And uh, I love them. One Life Fully Lived. And also, my good friends at NetSuite have invited me to go on the road with them to help incite, inspire, motivate, educate, and uh, whatever eight uh, entrepreneurs and growth businesses around the uh, excited states of America and Toronto. So October 24th, excuse me, August 24th in beautiful San Diego, come visit us. September 20th, Denver, 26th in beautiful Toronto, Canada. September 27th, New York, New York, and November 9th in Miami. To request your VIP invitation to the next Ready Business Tour with NetSuite, blackhole at legendsandlosers.com as well. Also, we'd love it if you checked us out at legendsandlosers.com and subscribe. We're uh, sending out some fun stuff. Check it out. We got a new um, uh, special um, episode of Legends and Losers that we are uh, not releasing, but we'll be giving away to people who join our mail list at legendsandlosers.com on uh, personal category design. So that's almost cooked. If you join our mail list, uh, you'll get a note about that when it comes out and it will only be available to legendsandlosers.com subscribers soon coming 
a uh, fun episode that Matt Johnson, the producer of Legends and Losers, and I did together on how you can develop a legendary category for yourself that'll work with your personal brand. All right. We would like to thank Equity Directory, connecting startups with the talent and resources they need to build a legendary business. Harper Collins Instant Classic, Play Bigger, Help Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. NetSuite, number one in cloud ERP, come out and see us. OneLifeFullyLived.org, dream, plan, and live your best life. It's October, Sacramento. Spiro, the sales app for salespeople and sales managers who like to make money. Our friends, including Vaughn at Rapid Media in beautiful Australia at rapidmedia.com.au. Pursuing results, the producers of legendary podcasts and this one, our good friends at Interview Valet, uh, podcast interview marketing, get on some podcasts and get some business done. The amazing book by Ray Wong, our friend and guest. Uh, this is a must read called Disrupting Digital Business. An awesome podcast to check out, Unbreakable Mind with our friend and guest, the legendary Navy SEAL founder of SEAL Fit, Mark Devine. Tahoe Truckee Homes, we make your Tahoe dreams come true. And Doctors Without Borders, you make a donation and we make a difference with the most at-risk people on planet Earth, Doctors Without Borders or MSF. We would like to remind you that this oddcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network. All rights remain disturbed, and we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. In the event of a water landing, Legends and Losers can be used as a flotation device. Objects in mirrors may appear larger and sometimes smaller than they actually are, so pay attention to your mirrors. This oddcast was produced in a studio that absolutely contained nuts. It is never tested on GMOs. Listen to David Bowie. Johnny Cash was right. Support your local marketing guru. And in the event of a four-hour erection, call somebody who likes you. Thank you, Candy Dandy. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Our deepest apologies today go out to Greg Clark, CEO of Symantec. Sorry, Greg, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, friends. Be legendary, and we'll see you soon on another episode of Legends and Losers. <laughs>